is Gregor. I used to work with TT for quite a while. A bit back, and I have 15 minutes. All right, let's go. So um, I started out in design uh, with Sonten Kumasetti. I spent a few years at Skanska at a builder, and uh, finally arrived at a, at, a, uh, at a startup called Energy Metrics here in New York, where we deal with existing structures, buildings, and take performance data of buildings. So it's it's getting away from the creative bits, like step at a time, and now there's hardly any creative things left. So. So Energy Metrics has a, a, a background in, in building management systems and uh, building automation systems. So all the BACnet and Modbus stuff, the things that decide when the air handler goes on and off. Uh, we've done a, a ton of stuff uh, integrating uh, SharePoint databases with, uh, with BIM models for facility management. We work with data center customers. And ultimately, we've done a lot of uh, time series capture, storage, analytics, and visualization. So that's where the whole thing starts to be. It doesn't fit in SQL anymore. It's uh, like also a big Internet of Things. So let's um, let's let's do a quick, quick, quick one on the Internet of Things frenzy here and the smart workout. So let's say you're a you're a fitness coach, you're a great running coach, and you hit it out of the park. You have your own book, you have your you have your web page, you have your video, and you want to take it to the next level. So let's let's see how this came about, right? So a long time ago, you use a watch and you measure distance on a map and you keep a spreadsheet. Next generation, you use a GPS watch. You hook it up with USB and you keep a spreadsheet. Then you use a GPS watch, hook it up with USB, and you join runbuddy.com to basically map your stuff not on a spreadsheet anymore so that you can access it anywhere you want. And then Internet of Things happens, and all of a sudden your watch talks to your smartphone, which loads it up to the Internet which is when the, in, when the data gets consumed by your, by your staff of running coaches in Australia that decide when to breathe, when to eat, when to do what kind of nutrition and feed it back to you in real time. That's just like fleet monitoring if you want. You have sensors, you have a gateway, you have the cloud, you have smart guys, and this thing is called a feedback loop. And that's what we don't have in buildings. That's what we keep talking about in, in design and architecture, but that's what we don't have with buildings. So generation one. Uh, you, you watch, uh, use your watch, you map it, and use a spreadsheet. That is basically residential buildings, right? Next, next generation around here, GPS watch, so you have sensors. Use a USB stick, and you keep a spreadsheet. That is your, your, your typical commercial real estate with, uh, with a building management system. Um, then you do GPS, USB, and you join runbuddy.com. So this is when you decide that it's a good idea to join, uh, to join a benchmarking site, you know, like uh, Energy Star and these things. But you're basically not doing anything in real time with your building data. And then generation four comes around with the Internet of Things, and there's quite a, quite a bunch of choices now with, uh, with Cyfri, with, uh, with Chariot, with TempoDB, a lot of time series databases in the cloud. But what's missing is, is the gateways. There's, no, there's no, like no questions asked, little box that you can stick in your building and, and receive the data. And that's, that's where we, we've been quite, quite busy in, uh, in the last year developing. So let's do uh, equipment at a time before we head to uh, buildings. So we developed a fleet monitoring solution uh, for, for legacy equipment. So it's, it's you take not smart equipment like chillers, uh, generators, cooling units, crack units, and make them smart. And, and you do that for 50 bucks a pop using Raspberry Pi, for instance. So the point is your equipment sits in, in a data center, let's say, in, a, in, a, in an IP-based BACnet BMS system. And if you show up with some box and you tell them like, oh, we're going to receive the data and we're going to put it on the internet, they'll just kick you out, right? Because it doesn't work like that. So what we do instead, we, we hook up against the equipment on a serial connection using Modbus, for instance. So this is a strictly local connection. We get it into a smart device. So this could be an Arduino or a Raspberry Pi or something. And then we just, we just push it out on the, on the guest Wi-Fi. So that's called like network isolation, right? So you got to be on a different network if you want to get data out. Um, it goes up to a to web service and then eventually into some time series uh, storage system. The benefits of that is uh, you, you get visibility for the first time, kind of, right? You, you get visibility of performance, uptime, outages, maintenance issues. So this has been done for quite a while with, uh, with like wind generators, for instance. They have fleet monitoring on those. Royce Royce has done it with uh, aircraft engines for quite a while. Um, they probably know where that plane is. Um, so when it comes to performance and maintenance issues, uh, questions like how, right? So this is when you can start to, like it circles back to you creative guys, you can continuously benchmark data against, simula uh, against simulations and specs, right? And then you can start challenging because it's of course not gonna match up right away. 
You can challenge the simulation, you can challenge the equipment, you can challenge your duct system and sensors. And that's all good because finally you're having a constructive dialogue. Currently we're not even talking, right? Nobody knows that, I mean, you, you have a lead building, it was gold five years ago, but you got no idea how it's operating right now. So once you have the data up somewhere centralized in the cloud, you can, you can dish it down into Excel, into web pages, you can do all this JavaScript and Angular stuff. You can, you can hook up a big simulation, you can MATLAB for that, or any, any sort of different tools and drive little dashboards where you can basically say, this is my weather today, this is the temperature, this is the humidity, this is my IT load, this is what temperature I want in my hot aisle, and this is how my equipment should be performing. And if it doesn't, you can talk about it. What we observe, uh, observe with this kind of stuff is that there is, there's always multiple consumers of data. So a lot of systems try to lock you up. It's kind of like closed system end to end, but there's owners, vendors, operators, consultants, and they all, they all have different approaches to what to do with the data, right? Um, and, and then you take it from equipment level to systems and then it's, it's like it's, it's complicated stuff because you walk into a building and you look at the BMS system, they all do it differently. They have new different naming conventions, they have uh, different systems and different sort of nodes and equipments and, and the ease is, the, the, the ease of capture is very important. So you can't spend much time in the building because if you do then it, then it won't scale. Uh, network isolation is key. And then what, what we feel is very important is the ease of data access down the pipe and, and ability to share your data. So this is where, where we kind of like cooked up EM Core. EM Core is a platform as a service. It runs an industry gate time series database. And it's basically an exchange style B2B offering where you trade building performance. So the idea is you have guys that have data and buildings. They're locally networked. They don't want to lock into a closed ecosystem. They're publishers of data if you want. Store it in the middle and you facilitate an exchange to, to guys that know what to do with the data. Dashboards, compliance, you keep existing relationships in check and those are subscribers to data. So the idea is Internet of Things has, uh, that there's, there's quite a bunch of smart, smart uh, appliances now so they're not Windows servers anymore but they're uh, like little, little gadgets, they run, they, they run Linux and they, they talk Modbus and BACnet so you grab the data from the buildings through that and then you push it out, uh, you push it out into the internet. So the process for that on, in, in, in our system is, is actually fairly simple. Uh, you go to EM Core, you hook up, you get a, you get a, you get a user key, uh, you manage, you manage your, your boxes in your buildings, you get, a, you, get a, you get a key for the box, and then you, uh, you, you configure gateways on the box and then you just walk away and the data starts streaming. So it's fairly simple to get the data. And then, and then you, you hand it over to creative guys and they build dashboards, web pages, applications, analytics, all that stuff. So enabling that, right? Removing the barriers to upload and store the real-time data, receiving and keeping data in full resolution, and facilitating exchange between multiple parties. That's, that's what we're trying to do. Three different folks, three different types of background, um, so lots of, lots of different opportunities for questions. So my question is to Gregory. Um, would your service, let's say, replace a BMS consultant? I'm sorry? Would your, would your firm and service replace a BMS consultant or would it basically augment it on top of a contracted BMS consultant's work? Uh, yes and no. I mean, yes. we continue to do like building automation work, mm -hmm. but we'd, we, we like to focus on, on, on grabbing data from, from existing buildings. Like um, I was gonna ask, in, in that process for, let's say, um, purpose of uh, having a calibrated energy model, who would, who would determine the um, frequency of uh, data spits, right? So, okay, there are the data loggers, but are they capturing data one at every second or every 10 minutes or every day? So all, all those questions, and I know they are getting stored somewhere, and the, of course the, um, the volume of the storage will depend on how frequent you're taking the data, right? So. Those are those are like the things that come to my mind. They're not. Yes, I, I agree one hundred percent. Okay. Um, so we, I mean, we, we have the same. We have the same thing with BIM, right? Mm -hmm. We wonder we build all these rich BIM models and we take the data in it and then it kind of goes to scan scan the boys and then it just disappears. I mean, no owner has their has their BIM models, or at least like very very few do. And I think that's that's the same that's the same you're addressing with uh, with the BAS data. And then is it uh, is it the intention that that data keeps uh, 
being keeps like a logged in for like tens of years or is it just going to die out at yes i like to call it a uh, dense fast forever mm -hmm. so dense as in insane numbers of points fast as in like second intervals minute intervals and forever as in literally like uh, wh what's interesting if you go the, the low hanging fruits are uh, mechanical systems and chiller plants right mm -hmm. and if you take pumps and stuff and you can you can you can literally show performance curves as measured after one year, after two years, after three years, after five years, it's like you can see system fall apart in the data. And, and that, can, that can initiate maintenance. So the, the, the biggest opportunity is actually in, in long-term data. Mm -hmm. right. Thank you. Since it, I'm at the mic, I'll turn that right around. Thank for you, Gregor. thank you, sir. Uh, my question was for Gregor, and it's the, the title is Calling the Bluff. Have you actually had the opportunity to embed sensors in the building and disprove uh, some of the analysis results that were going on during the design phase? And if not, what's keeping you from doing that? So we, we didn't actually disprove any of the analysis from the design phase because that wasn't available to us. I mean, you have buildings that are like around five, 10 years, so that's all in a cellar somewhere in a shelf. I mean, you can't just pick that up. It's uh, not available, that data, I think, in, in most cases. And I think you, the answer to your question is, it's really tiring because we've been doing BIM for such a long time and it's still minority in our industry, uh, it's culture. Like you go to any engineering firm and there is so many guys that do engineering and so few guys that do BIM and it's the same in architecture and, it's and so then it gets worse as you go into construction. Like you try to grab data from buildings, it's, uh, it's the, the guys that, that, that are, s well, the guys that have access to the data aren't incentivized to perform better. Like nobody gets a bonus because the building operates 20% cheaper. Everybody gets fired as the light goes up. Um, and uh, so, so there's culture in the way of, of doing that. And I think uh, I, I disagree uh, with what you said about instrumenting bridges. I mean, that technology is absolutely available. And I don't think it has anything to do with, with the kind of big data you're talking about. I think it's just culture in a way of actually doing that. It's like that tracking that stupid flight that fell in the water. I mean, that's totally possible, too. That sort of gets at my question. You said it's really hard to get the data out because there's no incentive. I wonder if there's um, sort of a more guerrilla approach. I know we have one hackathon project tomorrow that's going to look at building some really simple sensors to measure comfort. And if instead of trying to partner with owners, if you went into libraries, institutional buildings, and just sort of hid these things under tables and started collecting data, if you could actually store start to generate some useful, useful yeah, data. Yeah, 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 Cooper. Uh, the universities actually, like like collecting data from campuses, incentivizing students to to playfully engage with energy data has been uh, has been really successful. And I think the more use cases we generate using using those forward thinking clients, uh, the well, the, the, the easier we will tackle that culture barrier of engaging with, uh, with with other places where it's a little more difficult right now. David, um, how does your tool differ from Structure Sensor? And what uh, protocols are you going to? You're referring to the sensor by Occipital? No, Structure Sensor that uh, was started on Kickstarter and yeah, incorporated I th I Prime Sense. Yeah, okay. So uh, they're made by, it's made by a company called Occipital. Um, so mobile 3D scanning is a fundamentally different problem in our estimation than, uh, than tripod-based 3D scanning. Uh, because so much of our customers are, are commercial real estate and, and we're scanning spaces that are five to 500,000 square feet, you know, you need a longer range uh, device. And so we've used LiDAR for that as opposed to an infrared approach. Um, we've also decided that the textures that you get off of mobile-based devices are not up to par with what we need. So uh, different tool for different purpose, but uh, you know, big fans of 3D scanning in general. Uh, Greg, did you want to append to the last question? No, I wanted I wanted to comment. Uh, I, I actually uh, yeah, got I actually looked at your your stuff yesterday, and I was literally floored. It's it's so cool. <laughs> um, what what we've done is uh, so so we, we we had this BIM model, right? All out BIM, structural, architectural, mechanical, of a of a really big like Walmart sized data center, right? There's a lot of stuff in it. And we hooked it up with a with material database and equipment database and documents and it all lived with Navisworks and and we gave it to the facility management team and I don't think they've used it yet because 
they don't have a computer that can actually open the file, and uh, they don't have a person that is that is uh, fearless enough to to do it. Whereas I think uh, where I would love to see your stuff is is a, is a lightweight augmented addition to what we do with BIM to give to to owners, like to go in a place. Do your stuff, and then and then on a on a piece by piece kind of like wherever you need to do work, add a little bit kind of as you go. So I, I think this is really cool stuff. 